Over the months on the Maverick Sports Podcast, we have interviewed stars such as Skulk Berger and Trevor Immelman, spoken to important figures such as Paddy Upton and Doug Ryder. But today we give over the platform to the biggest issue of our time, perhaps any time since World War II, the coronavirus. The sporting landscape, both locally and internationally, has been decimated by cancellations and postponements, with the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo the latest casualty of the global pandemic. I'm Craig Gray, and joining me today is respected journalist and 20 times Comrades Marathon runner Mark Hayward. Mark is a veteran activist who was on the front line in the HIV crisis in South Africa more than a decade ago, and is editor of Maverick Citizen, which is telling vital stories of coronavirus and more at both a macro and micro level. As a sports lover, Mark understands the impact of COVID-19, and today we will attempt to gain a better picture of the situation through a sporting lens. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Craig, and thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a great pleasure, and thank you for coming on. I mean, it's an unusual world we're living in. Uh, you've been in the trenches of some massive uh, social issues in your time. Have you ever seen anything close to this, what we're going through? No, it's uh, unprecedented. We, we knew it would happen at some point. Uh, epidemiologists and health professionals have been warning of a virus of this scale for, in fact, for many, many years. But uh, now it's upon us. It changes the world. You know, I have lived through other epidemics and been very active in them. Uh, most recently, the HIV epidemic, which still rages across our world. It's by no means under control, and it's still the HIV virus or the human immunodeficiency virus still infects literally thousands of people every day, and many, many people still die of AIDS. But this is, in a sense, of a different order, and it's partly of a different order because the virus if you like, operates in a different uh, uh, way and concertinas all of its effects into a very, very short, uh, short period of time. So yes, this is troubled and testing times. Why is this coronavirus, Mark, for those of us that don't really understand it, we've had SARS and MERS, which I understand are of the same family. Why did they not feel like such a big crisis compared to coronavirus? Well, uh, yes, first of all, uh, SARS, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, were both coronaviruses. Uh, there was an unknown to those viruses. They were new. They spread uh, rapidly uh, around the world, um, but they were contained, burned themselves out, if you like. The thing with the novel coronavirus or COVID-19, and COVID-19 refers to the disease that is caused by this virus, is first of all that it is highly, highly infectious. And we didn't really know how infectious it was when it first started in Wuhan uh, in China. And the second thing is that even though most people do not suffer severe illness as a result of it, I think the fact that a percentage, a very small percentage do, but that that illness comes on very quickly is creating a huge pressure on the healthcare system and particularly the high care part of the healthcare system, the intensive care part of the healthcare system, because it requires people to have access to respirators and so on, respirators for, for if, if, if we're to keep people alive. So it's, it's really about the way this virus behaves that is creating, that has created this global uh, shutdown uh, in the space of literally a couple of months. Tuesday, we saw the Olympic Games being postponed. And I mean, that's a massive decision in all ways. Obviously, it's a massive sporting decision that hasn't happened since the Second World War, that the Olympics have had to be postponed for anything. Yeah. But it's also a massive commercial decision. There's a lot of jobs on the line. Were you surprised it took as long as it did for the International Olympic Committee to come to this conclusion, given what we know about the virus? Yeah, I think it was inevitable. I think it's been inevitable for probably three or four weeks from the point when we saw the virus getting outside of China, the rapid movement of the virus initially in Southeast Asia, then in the United States and, and in Europe. And it became clear to us that it will take many months to get this thing under control and to get it under control, we need to implement systems for physical distancing, social distancing between people. 
personally, I could have told you <laughs> three or four weeks ago that the Olympics could not go ahead. And it's a great tragedy, but it has to be done. You know, there's no measures are being taken in response to COVID-19 that are unnecessary. In fact, the stronger the measures that we take, the faster we take them, the better the possibility we have of limiting the duration of global disruption and beginning to re constitute a post-COVID-19 society. But but that's potentially quite a long way away. And we can talk uh, a little bit later about maybe the deeper philosophical yeah. impact of this. You know, Maybe it will change the world for, for the better or certainly is going to change the world in one way or another. And we can maybe un try and unpack that a little bit later. Something that's close to your heart is the Comrades Marathon. You've run that 20 times. And I mean, they still defiantly holding out at the moment. They, you know, they, they said uh, in a press briefing, uh, on about March the 16th, that they're still going ahead at this stage. They, they, they're they not willing to postpone or cancel yet. And that led to a bit of a spat between Sports Minister Nati and Tetwa and the Comrades Marathon organizers. Um, are you, I mean, first of all, you're going into lockdown. We're all going into lockdown shortly. Are you still keeping your training up? How would you do that if, if it were to go ahead? But it's highly unlikely it will, surely. Yeah, look, uh, I'm not running the Comrades this year. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> I decided that 20 was enough uh, when I completed my <laughs> took you that long year. to come to that conclusion. <laughs> it took me a long time, and I, I still love it. And in some ways, this is a very selfish thing to say, but in some ways I feel some relief uh, that the Comrades won't happen this year because I won't be sitting there feeling separation <laughs> Uh, anxiety and 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 so on, but I'm I'm keeping fit. But we'll 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 come to that. Look, I the first thing I would say, as I said with the Olympics, I can tell you that there will be no Comrades Marathon uh, in 2020. It will have to be cancelled, uh, and that is very sad, and it is tragic for many runners because I also know what goes into the comrades on all of those 15,000 or 20,000 people who, who run. It's a life commitment. It's an emotional commitment. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge achievement when you get to the end of it. So, you know, I guess I can understand why the Comrades Marathon Association is holding out, but I think it, it, it's problematic because it actually shows that they don't really understand this epidemic. I think they're thinking, well, you know, we're in March now, there's all of April, there's all of May, and we're only running comrades on the 14th of June this year. And by that time, things will be under control. I think that things, hopefully things will be being controlled, but we will not be out of the COVID-19 woods by that date. So I think comrades should recognize that and do what other responsible uh, running organizations have done. Look what look at Park Run. You know, Park Run, you have yeah. 40,000 people a week running Park Run, but Bruce Fordyce and uh, uh, Paul Sinton Hewitt in England have stopped the Park Run in the public interest. Yeah, and I mean, that's uh, it's vital. And we saw the Cape Epic called off. Although that also felt slightly reluctantly, they they left it late in the Cape Epic, and it's it's yeah it's hard it's easy to be critical after the fact. But uh, a lot of athletes I, I ran into some uh, some Swedish riders uh, on the Sunday that the Cape Epic should have started. I was just going for a walk, and uh, they were having a ride because the Epic had been called off, and they were pretty angry that the organisers had waited till Friday night to finally call it off on the advice of the Western Cape government because they had only it landed that Thursday from Sweden. And had they called it off earlier, uh, it could have saved the trouble for a lot of people and possibly yeah. infected people coming into South Africa. I suppose there's no right answer uh, when it comes to calling off sports events because there's such big commercial considerations around these yeah. things as well, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, there is no right answer. And, you know, I think what you can say in the defense of the Cape Epic uh, organizers was that, you know, a month ago, it was much less clear just how this virus was going to, to, to move. Um, you know, remember in South Africa, I mean, I rode the uh, Cape Town cycle tour, what, uh, a month, less than a month ago. Gosh, yeah, things yeah. have moved, moved very fast <laughs> at the beginning of March. At the point when that cycle tour took place, I think we'd had, we'd probably got four or five infections. Uh, in the country, and there were none in the Western Cape. You know, we were lucky that the Cape Cycle Tour 
actually took place, but in the days that followed it, it became much clearer what was what what was going on. So I, I think I understand the angst of the of the Swedish riders, but I think the Cape Epic can be forgiven because that was really the kind of critical week where people were seeing just what the implications were and how it would have a bearing on sport and sports events. Yeah, and 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 then there's been certainly it happened in Italy for a while. It happened in Spain. Um, the PSL, the Premier Soccer League in South Africa, wanted to do that. They wanted to continue games behind closed doors, which uh, they, they did it in Italy. And we've seen a lot of footballers who have tested positive for COVID-19 subsequently, whether or not that was uh, when exactly they tested is, is uh, or contracted mm-hmm. the virus is not in, entirely clear. But the point being, the PSL wanted to continue games behind closed doors. Thankfully, the South African Football Association um, said no ways and, and called that off. And uh, what do you make of this idea of behind closed doors if it's just 22 people? I mean, it's still a social gathering, isn't it? It's still a social gathering, and most sport is contact sport, certainly rugby, football, yeah. uh, you know, even running. I mean, I, I've thought through these things as a sports person, you know, even running. Even at, at the point I was wondering, well, surely we can continue with the park run. But, yeah. you know, when you're puffing and panting, what you're doing is puffing and panting out respiratory droplets. And if there's somebody else close by who's also breathing deeply, uh, they're pulling in what you are putting out uh, and becoming infectious themselves. And, you know, those 22 people or 30 people or whatever it takes, a particular sport, uh, are usually... Uh, in relationships, they very often have children, so they have to go out of the stadium when the sports game game is over. So if they've been infected in a sports game, they go out and they take the virus out, and they spread it in the community and so on. And that is the pattern of infection. And as I said at the beginning, when you have a very infectious virus, something that moves very easily between people. Uh, you know, it only takes a few people to create a cluster, to create an outbreak and to create a much more difficult job for health authorities to try and bring it under control. Yeah, I mean, this is a massive social issue. It's a massive economic issue. It it, it sometimes feels a bit churlish talking about sport in these times. Um, But certainly at a professional level, sport is not only a pastime. It's not only something that gives fans joy. It's a massive employer of people. Mm. It's a massive business and uh, directly or indirectly sport in this country and globally employs tons of people. And the possible ramifications of the shutdown of leagues, competitions is massive economically and could lead to you know, many more job losses. Is, is that something uh, that concerns you or, or is that just an inev- inevitable collateral damage of what we're going through? Well, it, it's uh, inevitable collateral damage, but of course it's it's concerning. And, you know, sports, the sports fraternity, sports associations, dis- different disciplines need to make a plan uh, for sports people uh, as well uh, as to how you're going to mitigate it. As you say, sports people have livelihoods. Those livelihoods will be disrupted. They won't get incomes. The people who gather around sports, whether as sponsors, uh, um, advertisers, uh, even people who put little sparser shops uh, around a a big event, uh, will all be affected. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to try to uh, see how people are going to be affected. You know, just this morning, I saw an email from the old from old Eds, a running club in Johannesburg, yeah. um, about how you know the cancellation of running events was impacting upon uh, some of their runners who depend upon running uh, to make money, and making an appeal to members of old Eds and giving a bank account and saying, please during this time let's uh, show solidarity with with our fellow sports people people who are perhaps not as comfortably middle class and comfortably well off as as you are and i think that's great and i think that's what should be happening uh, all over the place um and then i think we should also be thinking about how do we put things back together again yeah uh once we are on the other side of this uh, epidemic 
And that is a is a massive question because we don't know how broken it's going to become. I mean, it's it's mm. certainly going to break, but we don't know to what extent. Is it going to be a million splintered pieces, or is it a clean break that can be you know rejoined? Uh, uh, in, in the South African sporting context, the big three football, rugby, cricket, in particular, they they re, they're heavily reliant on broadcast money to pay their you know, their bills, which includes contracting players but in the case of football and rugby a lot of that money trickles down to the various clubs uh, and those clubs pay their players and employees and 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 so you can see the whole pyramid collapsing if a broadcaster like Supersport decides well you know you're in breach of contract because I've got no product you're not giving me super rugby you're not giving me the PSL on TV that's what the contract says I know this is speculation but do you think there will be a fair amount of of leeway before we get to that that broadcasters will take a view that you know it's no one's fault and we've just got to ride this out well i hope that broadcasters will take that view you know we need to minimize uh, economic disruption as much as possible and broadcasters have a social responsibility as much as they have a business imperative so they need to be thinking about this you know we're all in this together yeah and we should all share some of the burden together so if you behave in a selfish and completely self-interested way and you just cut off your dependence then i think when it's over people will look at broadcasters for example in a different light and they may demand their pound of flesh and they would be right to demand their pound of flesh because you know the principle that we have to operate throughout this epidemic is yes protect yourself but also protect your society if you protect yourself at the expense of your society then we're going to be very very damaged and in fact it will take a great deal longer to recover from this and in fact the very notion that you can protect yourself and and uh, damn the rest of society is wrong because it will come and it will knock back on your door again in one way or another yeah, that's uh, massively important. Talking about protecting yourself, certainly in a South African context, that's that's pretty difficult when you think of the shanty towns we have yeah. and the the close proximity of living. the The idea of self isolating at home is almost impossible in in large areas in South Africa. How are we going to manage that? What is your understanding of what government's trying to do around those that issue of of people clustered in such huge numbers in in small areas. Mm. Well, that's going to be our challenge, and that's what's going to mark us out as facing a different challenge to, for example, a country like the United Kingdom or the United States or European countries because they don't have uh, millions of people literally living in conditions that are conducive to rapid viral uh, transmission. so government and i you know i talk to them <laughs> about these things has to have a plan i mean there's consensus across the world and there's consensus amongst the public health community in south africa that a lockdown is necessary and we're about to start a lockdown to stop this this virus but scientists have also said to government listen the lockdown on its own is not going to solve the problem and I hope yeah. that government is hearing that. Scientists that I'm talking to are saying the lockdown will only work if it is combined with intensive scale up of testing. We need to find out who has this virus at the moment, particularly while it's relatively small numbers. We need to diagnose them. We need to quarantine them. I mean, if there's people sitting in a in a shack with six other people, yeah. you don't want to leave that person in that shack for the next 21 days because after 21 days you'll have six people with coronavirus rather than than one person so it has to be scale up of test it has to be treatment it has to be quarantine and then there have to be mitigating factors craig i mean we you know it, in, in a country where there's so much poverty you've got to make a plan yeah. to make sure that people have water during this pe- period to make sure that people have food during this period you know a, a viral epidemic can, if, if mishandled, can spawn an epide- epidemic of domestic violence. It can feed alcoholism. So that's why I say it creeps into every corner of life and thinking and society, and we have to try to follow it into those corners. 
uh, and work out how we are going to bat it out and and deal with its its implications. So it's enormously complicated and it's enormously challenging, but but we don't have a choice. Is South Africa equipped to do that? On one level, I think South Africa is equipped. Um, uh, we're fortunate compared to, for example, many other African countries that we have quite an advanced uh, public healthcare system. It may not feel like that given all of our complaints. Oh, but we... I was going to say that it does seem counterintuitive. Do, do we really? <laughs> well, you know, our health public, I've been a health activist for 20 something years and I can tell you our public health system is broken and there are huge problems with it. But mm. as we've seen in the last few weeks, we have institutions like the National Health Laboratory Services and the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. You know, we have a, a, a private sector that has to pull with the public sector in this. Uh, we have had the experience of, of HIV and AIDS. And you know, one of the things that that has given us is, a, is an advanced system for testing. You know, we, we, we test millions of people a year for HIV. Yeah. So we have the networks, we have the diagnostic capability, we have the, 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 the science, we have the scientists. So we have a good chance um, of beating it. Uh, and of getting ahead of it, probably a better chance than many uh, similarly situated developing countries, I think. Talking about the quarantine situation and people in, in shacks, if someone is tested and the testing shows us that there's X amount of people that are, are carrying the virus in, in these close quarters, where would they, how would they be quarantined in, in that situation? Is there any plan that you know of? Uh, centers or, or something yeah this is something that we th th that's the million dollar question and this is something we are thinking very hard about and the government is thinking very hard about and as i understand it at the moment what would happen is that you may have to have you know lockdowns within lockdowns if if, if you know so if you have an outbreak in a particular district or sub district or even on a particular street Mm. Uh, you may have, have to have a more intense lockdown on that street, or you may have to move infected people out into places where they are isolated uh, whilst they recover and whilst they get rid of the virus and then keep a very close eye on that area to see who else gets infected um, with the virus. So it's going to require very close micromanagement. It's very dystopian, the, the image of sort of locking people down. I think of that movie District 9 where, yeah. where the aliens were sort of locked down around Joburg. I don't know if you ever saw it, Neil Blomkamp's did, yeah. very fine yeah. movie. Um, and I know that was sort of futuristic, but it does have that kind of feel that we could get to a situation like that. Yeah, we're, I think we're already in that situation. I mean, it's unparalleled, <laughs> you know. I've seen pictures of empty fairgrounds, empty cities, and sort of dystopian mm. pictures you normally see in films, of sort of post-apocalypse type situations. So, yeah, we, we're there. And people need to realize that we are, we're, we're there. Uh, but we have to get out of it. And all of us want to get, get out of it. I mean, in some ways, Craig, this may sound very strange to say, in some ways, we're lucky with this virus because pathogens can be much more virulent. Yeah. This one moves very fast between people, but, but most people don't get sick. Yeah. Another virus can come along that can wipe out young people or that can uh, uh, cause much more severe disease. So this is a trial run, severe as it may seem. Mm. Don't, I don't want to be misquoted, but there's there's some degree of fortune yeah. that we have as we do our best to manage and mitigate. In your experience, um, have, have governments generally, have they war-gamed this scenario out? Because it seems like a lot of governments around the world have been sort of caught by surprise by this, and um, which strikes me as odd because I would have thought with all the money that's spent on defense and, and, and health around the world that... Uh, there would have been some sort of planning, scenario planning for something like this, which doesn't seem to be the case. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. They haven't wargamed it. That's the, that's the problem. We have known about this. There was a book published by a very Pulitzer Prize winning journalist called Laurie Garrett, Garrett in, I think, 1996 called The Coming Plague, hmm. uh, which was a book based upon science. I mean, it's got a very sensational title, but it was a thick, weighty scientific book looking at viral outbreaks, viral epidemics, and saying something serious is coming. 
every year the World Health Organization produces pandemic uh, reports or epidemic reports for, for at least 30 years. They've been saying that this is coming, but or that something like this is is a danger that the world must prepare for. Hmm. But you see, the problem is that you say we put a lot of money into health. Well, actually, we put a lot of money into defense, but we don't put a lot of money into health. And what has happened in the last 20 or 30 years is that public healthcare systems all over the world have uh, uh, been emasculated and, and broken. Uh, primary healthcare all over the world is ineffective. You know, there was a thing called the Alma Atta Declaration. I've forgotten which year it was, but it talked about healthcare for all by the year uh, 2000. And, and it was a World Health <laughs> Organization declaration. It never happened. So our systems for surveillance, our systems for primary health care that would, would, if they were there, would, would, would help us at a moment like this, have not been there. And that, again, has to be a lesson. I mean, after this, people have to say, listen, mm. what is important for a society and what is less important? In fact, the biggest security threat to the world uh, uh, is not going to be combated with the most advanced military airplanes and bombs and so on and so on. It's going to be combated with effective healthcare uh, uh, systems and much more equal healthcare systems. And, and I mean, South Africa has been grappling with that, with the NHI, the, the draft proposals in with uh, about our change to that. And, and, and this could probably accelerate that process uh, maybe more smoothly uh, in the post-coronavirus world. Well, I hope that it does accelerate the process. Um, NHI is controversial, hmm. uh, but the principle of universal health care, uh, universal quality health care, I think is something that we all uh, accept and, and agree with. And again, as, as we think post-coronavirus, we really have to ensure that we get a commitment that the way our society is run is, is, is fixed. You know, I draw a parallel between the 2008 financial crisis, which also shook the world and had huge uh, consequences, business consequences, unemployment consequences all over the world. But although there were a raft of short-term measures to prevent that crisis from getting completely out of control and crashing the world economy entirely, once those measures had brought things under control, the actual causes of that crisis were left in place, <laughs> were not changed. Yeah. yeah. And, and are still there today and will cause another global financial crisis. It may even be that it, <laughs> it comes as a consequence of the coronavirus crisis. We can't afford to do that again because I can tell you, although I'm not a scientist and studied in these things, this is not the last virulent uh, viral pathogen that is going to challenge either countries or the globe as a whole. No, uh, probably not, uh, almost certainly not. And you've got to hope that leaders have taken lessons from this and it's going to come at great cost, a lot of human life. But I suppose it's it's cyclical. Uh, it's not the first time plagues or viruses have, have caused human suffering. After 1918, the Spanish flu, were, were there lessons learned from that? Yes, I think so. Uh, it's a good question, but I would say that, you know, one of the things that happened after the Spanish flu it was linked to other things as well, was that there was for uh, 50 years across the world, particularly across the developed world, investment in public health care systems, things like the National Health Service uh, in England. There was investment in sanitation and systems of sanitation, mm. clean water. And all of those had a big impact for the rest of the century, really, in reducing disease and reducing uh, mortality death due to due to disease so i wouldn't trace it all back to the flu but the flu that 1918 flu which killed 100 million people was a very big shock mm. to the world system but it was a very different type of world yeah sure in those days um you know the yeah. by the time this virus is over i doubt i hate i shouldn't tempt fate but i'll say it no i won't say it. well uh, you know i doubt that the numbers of people who die will be as great as the 1918 flu. But because of our global interconnectedness, because of the way our healthcare systems work, because of the way business works, and so on, smaller numbers of deaths will probably have a much far greater global economic, social, political impact than the 1918 flu.
Yeah. And, and as we draw to a conclusion, uh, we spoke about philosophically. One thing this in, in the South African context that this, is, this coronavirus has certainly highlighted and I think shocked a lot of middle class South Africa is, is the state of living of most South Africans or many South Africans and how susceptible and vulnerable they are. Do you hope that when we come out of this, there will be a greater urgency to, from people who've maybe turned a blind eye to this and just carried on with their lives to understand why housing, why sanitation, why schooling uh, is so important? I, I, I really hope, <laughs> uh, I plead, I beg, uh, because our society is not uh, sustainable on this basis. You know, we live in a beautiful country. Uh, we started this discussion talking about sports. We love our sports. We have an environment that couldn't be better for sports. We have mountains for mountain biking. We have seas for water sports. You know, we, we have it all. Mm. And we're capable of building a society that is based upon the values in our constitution of dignity and equality, based upon the spirit that Nelson Mandela tried to inculcate in the country. But we let a lot of that go. And we accepted the inequalities because it didn't affect us directly, but now it's directly in our, in our face. Mm. And you know what's different, I think, and I'll make this point, is... is Remember, the HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, and AIDS killed 3 million people in the last 20 years in our country alone. Wow. And that had a great deal to do with inequality, but it didn't have the visibility yes. of this, this virus. But, but we should take lessons fr from that. And I just think you know, our mental health, all of us, will be happier people if we create a more... Uh, robust and secure society, because security against against COVID nineteen or its uh, successors will also be security against crime, security uh, against societal breakdown, security against epidemics of mental illness, which we have in this country of suicide, and et cetera, et cetera. We're not a pretty country. The picture is not pretty. And this virus has come along to draw our attention to that fact. Mark, on that point, I couldn't, uh, we couldn't go any further. That's a powerful statement. And thank you for your time today. Thanks for the uh, work you're doing, both at Maverick Citizen and on the front line of all these uh, issues. And uh, hopefully we can have you on again in a post-coronavirus world and we can talk about where we're at. Let's do that and let's try our best to sort this thing out in the meantime and let's keep our sporting codes working and our bodies functioning and our ambitions uh, in sport and everything else as high as they can be. Thank you. That was Mark Hayward who joined us today on the Maverick Sports Podcast. I'm Craig Ray. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll bring you some more episodes during the coronavirus, hopefully with some sports people as well, but we won't ignore the pandemic. Thank you and until next time. Thank you.